I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Bruno Basso. Bruno is a Henna Distinguished Professor and also an MSU Research Foundation Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences. He is an internationally recognized agroecosystem scientist and crop systems modeler. His research focuses on agriculture, sustainability, climate change impact on agricultural systems, food security, circular bioeconomy, and digital agriculture. His many awards include a couple I'll just mention, Fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science, and recently he won the 2021 Morgan Stanley Sustainability Solution Prize. He also serves as a member of the Board of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the US National Academies of Sciences. Please welcome Bruno Basso to the stage. Good morning, everyone. Great pleasure to be here with you this morning. I, um, it's, uh, it's very uh, interesting to share with you this vision, and I want you to understand that, that even as the title says, the future of agriculture and food system, I'm leaving out a lot of components that are either dealt later from you know, Federica, like I won't be talking much about the, the visions on, on genomics and other component, but the role of technology in agriculture and environmental sustainability in our food system is the key, the key of my talk. So more precisely, I work on those three major crops, corn, wheat, and uh, rice. And so as you can see, pos possibly surprised by the fact that they provide 70% of the, the calories. And even though all the other elements in the food system are so critical for our health, they provide a significant lower amount of calories. And part of my work is not just in the US. So I deal a lot with developing uh, countries. I just returned from a trip to Cameroon and so maize, wheat, and rice is, is, are basically the most important crops just about anywhere you go. And so we're very fortunate to have some of the best land to grow these crops. And at the same time, um, because of a high yielding, they, the farmers put a significant amount of input, sometimes not necessary. And so the environmental impact of this crop can still be uh, a, a threat to the environment versus you know the rest of the, the developing world where the yields are so low and they will uh, basically benefit much more from the type of work that we do on optimizing getting a significant greater increase for very little um, input and so I want to start just to show you and I know you're fully aware from the major media and it's this well known kind of uh, challenges that agricultural face and, and including in climate change. There's a lot of paradox about agriculture that is both the, the, the victim of climate change, but it's also a cause of climate change. And so agriculture has been, whether we want to define invention or not, but it's the best invention has allowed civilization to occur. So people wouldn't have to move around and be able to grow crops and, and uh, establish civilization. We need to continue to grow this nutritious food. So the question is not just food security, but it's nutritional security. So be able to have you know, the right level of uh, um, vitamins and, and so on. Uh, animal feeds and fuel, because plants basically provide that. The challenge is with less water and under uh, climate change. It is paramount to protect soils. I mean, soils hold the key for climate uh, change. And so water, air quality, biodiversity, we need to mitigate, so reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that occur from the agricultural system, because the goal, as you see the core of the talk, is about carbon negative agriculture. What does that mean? And then provide reliable revenue stream to farmers because it is very interesting and important to, to put yourself in this context where 
you know, farmers really bear the risk on changing their management practice. So if we give them advices, we are risk neutral. We don't, we still have a salary from Michigan State, we'll continue. They have to basically trust us and, and so it's important to incentivize the change, whether it's through policies or through consumers. And, and so that's uh, an important aspect. And in a nutshell, you know, this, these are major challenges. We lose some of the best land continuously, 10,000 hectares per day to urbanization. So think about that. Hopefully no one is from Texas, but the city of Houston, for example, sits on some of the best land, sugar land, black soils, and continues to basically expand into this very large uh, uh, housing complex and, and so on. So urban adjacent, not just in the US, but in general, this mega city. Um, so it's uh, just returned after, you know, before Cameroon was in Peru and Lima is 12 million people and keeps growing until basically have reached the mountains. And then we have deforestation. I'll show you some nice example about something close to us, how we lose land. Deforestation for conversion to palm oil, you know, just about anything that we use, cosmetics, and so there is this incredible demand for palm oil. Now, Europe leads the way in regulating a lot of this, and so they just put a new law that any product coming from outside Europe, including the US, has to be accompanied by a certificate of free risk decertification. So you, you cannot, you have to show that over the last, that this product came from a land that since the last five years was not um, in under forest. And so then we continue to have fires and uh, as a result of, uh, you know, drought and land degradation, soil erosion, just to put some context, we lose a pound of soil for every bushel of corn that we produce. And it takes thousands of years to generate new soil. Water quality close to us, you know, the uh, uh, Erie um, Basin and we, because of excessive amount of fertilizer. So this is an interesting that I want to show you. These are were fields outside the Chicago land and that we monitor. We've monitored from sky. This is basically the maps to show productivity of soybeans or corn and then until 21, now subdivisions. <laughs> so very interesting. So. We went back, we were the fly, said, hey, where are the fields? So climate uh, variability and change, as I mentioned, is a, a really uh, major threat for agriculture. I know you probably have seen different types of diagrams, but this is a comparison. You can understand the colors when it is blue, when you compare to a baseline of 30 years from 1950 to 1980s. Wherever it's blue, it, that means that year for that country was cooler. And so you can start seeing in the 90s and then the 2000s, there are no blues everywhere. These are highly careful measurements. So it's not the, the, the skeptical about the climate and temperature increase as it's just really not, no longer a possibility. And so you can see a major temperature increases, but it's not just the temperature increases, the frequency of the extreme events that they cause a major, a major threat. So you can see uh, the Midwest is projected to be wetter and the, po uh, the pl places that they're drier, even drier. We gain season. So the Midwest is actually potentially, if we could use that word, a little bit of a winner in terms of agriculture because we gain season, but you have to adapt with new genetics that is able to capture, you know, the full length of the season. And when I started doing modeling work, I remember as it was yesterday, um, not too long ago, 25, 30 years ago, but is, um, um, it was 360 ppm. And now, today, basically, I checked yesterday, it was 424 ppm. So um, that's strictly anthropogenic. So greenhouse gas emissions, to separate what comes from the field, the, the diagram, the histogram there on the right, and what is from the food system. So you can see the contribution to climate is decomposition of residues, greenhouse gas emissions, CO2, 
and uh, um, nitrous oxide comes from crop residues, manure management, a major component is from the enteric fermentation, maintain emissions from animals, rice cultivation, synthetic fertilizer, and the use of energy on farm for driving tractors, pulling you know, uh, energy for irrigation systems. And, and so that's the percentage back, but you have another 50% that goes into the retailers. So food processing, transportation, and indirect land use change. And so what does that mean? Indirect land use changes, if you have a decline in yield or you take some fields away, they are discounted by saying a new field will be grown somewhere else as a potential desert if you, uh, the deforestation. And so all the emissions from cutting the trees and they get quantified. So our research is extremely important because it shows that you don't need to calculate land use because yields are increasing. And so by offsetting that, you have less demand from new fields going into new production. So at the core of the economics, I, I made this graph uh, really simple in a way. The future looks at bioeconomy sitting before we zoom out. And so bioeconomy is obviously anything of political wheels and health and environment and markets and society, they're all impacted and they're all connected. Now, if you look at just the, the circular by economy, we we're going to see, as we're already seeing, you know, shoes made out of apple skin and, you know, all the possible um, reuse of products. And so the both go into pre-production, processing, and a major one, as you know, we lead, uh, uh, we have a Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, Federico's the scientific director, and we aim at using plants to generate energy, bioenergy. But they, you could also have materials, new chemicals, biochars, and storing carbon, which is what I work on. So modeling plants to be able to keep carbon, pull it from the atmosphere, as plants do for living. They do photosynthesis, they pull CO2 from the atmosphere and trying to keep through roots and the residue management into, into the ground. So as a general view, I know most of you are aware of what agriculture is and where has it been, but for every of, any of these cases, you know, in the beginning of 1900, mechanization came and that has allowed us to go from subsistence agriculture to a major spread. Any of this, unfortunately, did not come with a price on the environment. And so mechanization is the, the, one of the major and biggest environmental disasters, the dust bowl, because all the prairies were tilled in a dry moment, a dry environment. And basically the natural resources conservation, which back then was only called soil conservation service, was built as a result of the dust of the plains reaching Washington, D.C. And so Roosevelt created the Soil Conservation Service as a result of that. So we expanded the land, increasing yield, prosperity, but major impact on uh, the environment. Then fertilizer and agrochemicals, they almost came together with some of the improvement in genetics, and you probably kn knew about the world green revolution, you know, the possibility of having these plants that would be more responsive to fertilizer. So Norman Burlock, who, who I had the pleasure to, to met, meet and talk several times at CIMIT in Mexico, created this short uh, uh, size wheat cultivars that would respond to fertilizer and was, it's still the man that has basically fed more people, more than one billion people. The problem now from a really positive thing of, you know, uh, uh, allowing uh, the yields of wheat and maize in, you know, in some of the places, Mexico, but mainly India, going from less half a ton to four tons. So imagine the amount of, you know, food that could be generated to feed these people. Now, not necessarily, it's hard to say, the, the finger is pointed at about the environmental impact of the excessive use. But human dimension, it's, we're great at, at that, taking something that works and, and, and take it over the edge. And so now the excessive amount of fertilizer, pesticide, and all the chemicals has led into 
um, the impact that you just saw, you know, especially on water quality. Then in the 90s, we have improved breeding, and I'm sure Federica will talk about that, all the way to CRISPR. You know, instead of having just genetically modify, you can cut precisely and replace genes, and so great futures coming out of that. But there was a la large discussion in most of the places outside the US and few others in South America or China, GMOs are not allowed. And so unfortunately, Africa pays the price on that, that you say we cannot, they cannot use some of these improved genetics, and, uh, and so they, the yields remain low. So there is a, a component of um, you know, disconnect there as well. In the last few years, everything is about data. The amount of information that we can collect publicly available, you know, basically looking over from satellites. And so you see, I have left there, you know, artificial intelligence and satellites, drones, data analytics, all the omic sciences, you know, metabolomic and so on, microbes and sensors. But the present and the future is basically all around sustainability. You'll see how much demand there is from the food system, the food companies about you know, sustainable management from consumers in general. And so we link, that's basically what I work on. I work on building digital twins. So basically reproducing plants on the computer, but also with the goal of optimizing resources, okay? So environment, economics, and transfer the technology for uh, the socio uh, social aspect. And so there is basically a digital revolution. I know some of you maybe not all the details, so hopefully you learn a lot of where we are with technologies in agriculture, how much is used and how much farmers basically call me and say, hey, I saw a new technology that generates liquid fertilizer, just like the Oberbosch, you know, in on site. So you can have liquid fertilizer produced with the energy that if it's produced with solar panel, it will be 100% renewable. And so it's commercial. And, and so they, they're, they're just, it's pretty amazing. And so I put the, the picture there, not just to show, but to tell you that even the mass media, so this was an editorial on Forbes magazine, which you would dream about at agriculture being on Forbes. I always thought it was about money, but. Uh, so, but now you, you'll see in a video of a couple of minutes how the future looks like. But remember, it's not necessarily the future because all these things have been built. They just have to, they need the science to be able to uh, do the right thing at the right time at the right place. And so you got robotics, you have irrigation system that can put different amount of water for every single row of, of corn. And as I said, sustainability. So this is again, another thing with the sustainability price that, that I want, I would, you would never dream to have basically soil carbon and the project that allowed me to get the price be listed on uh, you know, Times Square in New York. Uh, and so the re sustainability is recognized by finance more than anything. And finance is basically deciding how to lend money. If you don't have a sustainability story, it's basically game over for many of the new companies. And so um, that's, uh, Again, sustainable farming, connecting people at soil carbon. And as a result of that, the Soil Inventory Project is an NGO that I have been privileged to, that I've co-founded with the former Vice President um, Al Gore. So this is a video I'll let you listen in two minutes. It's, it was provided by John Deere, which is one of the biggest company in machinery, how they're basically building all this, including some of the drone research that I do in connection with them. And uh, it's, it's inspiring in a way.
So engineering, as you can see, is just basically so much ahead of the game because it's man-made, okay? What I work on is on the biology and the integration with climate, which that I always said, you may have heard, I had a PBS news hour that had a lot of impact because I said that, uh, you know, agriculture is more complex than uh, uh, launching a rocket in the space. The math in the rocket is very precise. Our math is not precise because it's completely unknown what the interaction are gonna be like. And so the technology here, now the machinery, it's, it's critical to get the job done, but you have to have the doctor. It's like having a perfect MRI and having no doctor to be able to interpret or you know, tell you what you really have. And so the prescription, this is not a Photoshop. This is a farmer that we basically designed the, the, the Spartan helmet and the machine precisely put different hybrids of corn with different color you know, to be able to see. So that's, I thought you will enjoy that. And so that brings me back to the digital twins, which are basically the integration of computer simulation models. We simulate plants on the computer. This is an example of what we call process-based model. We capture all the process occurring on climate, soil, genetic, and how the crop is managed. So the first version of this model developed here in Michigan State by my former professor, received funding from the Central Intelligence of the US, was developed to predict how much wheat was produced in Russia during the Cold War. And so uh, he narrated that and expanded to the next generation of models called SALUS that now is used by IPCC and many other international projects to evaluate the impact of climate change and management and genetics on yield and the environment. So digital twins, uh, basically you have a virtual farm, a cloud-based analytics. You have digital twins, it's critical to scale solutions. So you can have imagery coming from satellite, airborne, drones. We can detect just about anything uh, on, on the field. Modeling evaluates what if scenarios. What if I do, what if I change cultivar? What if I plant a different? And so it's different than a statistical model where you have to have a lot of the inputs and you learn from that. This generates the data by integrating the knowledge. And now the most interesting thing that people are, are carbon intensity. So the carbon intensity is evaluating how much, how many, and the emissions from the field and be able to offset those emissions by storing carbon in the soil. And so we quantify through the modeling how much carbon is stored in the soil. And so one of the technologies that is really important um, that farmers is basically, in, you can see 68% of the US is mapped at one meter resolution. So the tractor, this is from tractors, the, the, the harvester drives by and can tell you every square meter of land how much variability is in the yield. So you can see the red areas from 100 bushels to 250 bushels. The problem is that this does not help the farmers to put it together unless it's integrated where you know, the behavior is understood. And so I developed this concept called yield stability where you know, each single pixel is analyzed and see how different it is from the neighbor and how different it is over time. And so you evaluate areas where you have constantly high productivity areas. And so that shows basically resilience and areas of the fields where they constantly underperform, losing money and environmental impact. And so that's through the machinery, but that's still not sufficient to scale also because we don't have all the data from the machinery. And so remote sense, sensing satellite this is an example integrated this is our planet basically breathing and dying you can recognize the seasons when you know the south starts planting and goes up and then the winter comes and gets darker and um, so we can do that but now remote sensing is at a, a resolution of flying every single day so we got in fact farmers who says oh i know you know that they're, they're surprised when we can show them their fields without even 
talking to them, and they always say, I knew the government was spying on me, but no, it wasn't the government. It was <laughs> so this is, an, uh, basically there are 1,400 images, one on top of each other. You can see the dates changing, and so we can basically see distance between plants and, and so on. We can measure if a field, we say, and that's very appealing to farmers, if the field is running a fever. So if it's hot, and so plants basically turn hotter than other if they don't have a sufficient amount of water or if they are stressed because they close this to matter and so the temperature goes up and so you can see the areas where it's cold and stable. So that part of the field is always cooler and that means has a sufficient amount of water that can satisfy the evaporative demand coming from, from climate. If you connect the two of them, then you have really understanding separating water stress from nitrogen stress and so one of these technologies and this has generated several patents and they've been used i scale this for every single field not just projected for every single field looking at satellites and so basically the u.s midwest conins wheat and soybeans is characterized by having about 50 percent of within field always high productivity and so that's why you know they're in business but 25 percent in varies by states and areas it's constantly underperforming and losing a significant amount of money as you will see and so what is the solution to that in terms of sustainability and profitability and then areas that they fluctuate from one year to the next so here is a little technical analysis of how much basically fertilizer hands in the mississippi river and the amount of money that they lose and so this is an example from those images and the yield maps and so in the high in the red areas they can lose up to 200 dollars per acre which is if a, that was a store or an industry they will think about twice buying that product again if it doesn't sell and so now it's finally and farmers have basically jump out of the chain they said i wasn't ready to see this because it's a little bit of pride uh, they don't want to go back and show their wives and or vice versa and, and that sort of thing But it's we have a good conversation on that So one of the future approaches that we incentivizing by capturing also improvements in biodiversity is From a profitability map We know now that we can spray different amount of inputs especially variable and then you can increase biodiversity by planting pollinators and alternative crops in areas where you don't have the productivity and investments. And so they can make more money by having incentives and carbon credits because corn produced by a field that has pollinators is worth a lot more from the food system. The companies will pay more in terms of uh, the sustainability that comes with. That's called scope three emissions. So, so the company will pay a premium to get this reduced greenhouse gas emissions and they offset their own you know, emissions um, in their reports and so on. So just to move a little bit faster, this is the, the changes of every single field and you can see the high and stable, low and stable um, in terms of productivity, how position in the landscape makes an impact, so depressions and the the modeling allows to evaluate what if you change from having heavy tillage conventional tillage with mobile plow to very little tillage you know planting directly and using cover crops and so you you store a significant amount of uh, soil carbon which offsets and that's basically the way what we call regenerative agriculture that farmers are embracing because they receive again incentives from the government they can sell a more sustainable product and lastly to show this climate smart commodities the government is investing in changing commodities to be climate smart so basically reward crops that they are produced in a more sustainable way so this is really happening with transaction you know and funding and so one of the technology that is really being adopted is we go from the stability map that shows you know the different level of productivity to a prescription maps like an rx where you say here you do this and here you do that which comes from the kind of work that i do and then you calculate the avoided emissions so now because i put less fertilizer or i've planted a biodiversity crop i am not emitting so much greenhouse gas emissions over those areas and so then there is a premium calculated on the cost of the price of uh, the carbon 
So luckily, this technology, it's not just Michigan State does a great job in trying to transfer because um, it is important. It goes in the hands of you know, the people. And, and so this is a company that I co-founded, with again, with Mr. Gore and uh, flagship pioneering. And so it's called SIBO, which means food in Italian. And he evaluates the value of the land. It's like a real estate. So you basically... Uh, you can click on any parcel and you find the value based on a scientific calculation, which is what is your yield, how stable it is, how much variability you have, what's projected to happen on your field. And so based on the normal transaction, then there is a, a, multi, uh, you know, a factor that adjusts the price. Of the, the, and so investment, land investment and banks, now we brought transparency to, to agriculture because if you buy a car, well, you look at the tires, the, the kilometers, the miles that they have done, buy a house, you do inspection. If you buy a field, you can't go and poke a whole you know, a sample. It's unbiased information like in economics. The farmer says, okay, you basically uh, compare to all the neighbors, but you don't really know how vulnerable that field is in losing environmental impact. And, and so I developed a few patents off, off of them. And so you have a sustainability score. So for every field, there is a sustainability score that tells you how much greenhouse gas emissions that field is emitting. What is the regenerative potential? Nitrate leaching. And, and so with my great satisfaction, I mentioned earlier, just last week, I learned that SIBO, the company, was uh, named top 100 uh, sustainability company by Time magazine, which is uh, really an incredible, uh, you know, so proud to have this, uh, you know, coming from my lab and, and Michigan State. I just have two more slides about that this, the work that I do it just doesn't help only the, the Midwest farmers or US farmers. I have a passion to help people cross the pond and everywhere else where they basically need the use of technologies and you can't invest all these resources. So this is an example of how a very complex model gets converted into a yield forecast. So the country of Tanzania uses a system to forecast yield that I've developed. Before, they had no idea how much food was produced, so there were pockets, areas where people just wouldn't have enough, and they couldn't be shouting, and there would be nothing. So now they have a knowledge of how much food is produced. Training is important. So as I mentioned, Cameroon is the next one that we're building, and this is the type of houses that are a little different from the one from Houston. But, uh, you know, mad houses and I um, need to move faster. But the complexity of the system, we need to move from a linear to a circular system. And these are all the basically the futuristic view of what is the, the technologies that is available current. And so one aspect that I didn't mention and I'll do it quickly is the possibility of generating energy on the farm which fixes two problems. For example, the manure produced by the animal operation can go in biodigesture, and the biodigesture generate uh, energy that gets sold you know, on the grid. You can see the biodiversity pollinators moving the animals on pasture land, capturing nitrate water for you know, uh, you know, drainage water and reuse it, uh, spoon feed the crop as you have seen, and so with this, uh, this is a paper published in PNAS, we show that agriculture can be net negative by 70%. So it's just basically happening in the future. So to conclude, I want to um, say, what did we talk about? Big data, sustainability, uh, digital twins are critical, including understanding you know, the profitability. You got all these new technologies monitoring and really detecting anything at any level over space and time. Policy are gonna play a critical role based on understanding profitability and deciding the best land, you know, how it should be allocated. Science continue to develop this, you know, prediction and trade-offs between profitability, water quality, energy efficiency, and ultimately we have to influence political will in a sense that should not this decision for people in the environment should not be politicized but we need to implement things that work for society on on a long term just to thank this is a talented group of people i have 20 people in the lab without counting the undergraduate so we require a significant amount of funding to keep the family alive here and i want to uh, leave you to 
just to say I'm a proud Spartan. I did my PhD at Michigan State. I went back to Italy for a while, left Rome for East Lansing. And um, so proud Spartan, I you may have seen me in the, in the commercial. Michigan State. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. Is this mic on? Okay. Reminder, if you're virtual, please use the question and answer feature in Zoom. And if you have a question in person, we will do it at this mic. But we did get a question, uh, Bruno, for you. And can you talk a little bit about the cost of this technology and how that's applicable to large and small farms? Very good. So the, the technology, like anything else, you have to put yourself into when new things come out. You know, the phone started uh, costing $2,000 for you know, the beginning. Now, the, uh, these sensors are significantly lower, and the, the large farms, it's a drop in the bucket to use it. Remember that they invest in machinery. For example, a tractor, advanced tractor, is very, very expensive. That's just the, the way the tractor and the technology is embedded in. So it isn't just necessarily uh, tailored at a large farm. But what I would like to say, which I haven't mentioned, 70% of the US land is rented. So farmers make money by renting more land. And that justifies the investment because one machine now does thousands and thousands of hectares, which brings the cost of the technology. So the future is unstoppable. The technology cannot be stopped. It's, it's basically happening. The, the, the more complicated things, if you want to put it that way, is that smaller farmers in the corn and soybean, they either get big or get out, unless you are in a different type of agriculture. You are peri-urban, you grow food for you know, market consumption directly, and it's, but this food feeds animals, and we basically don't eat corn. You know, 40% of the corn goes to animal feed, 40% of the corn goes to biofuel, 20% goes to sugary drinks. So there is not much, but the market is driven by big egg, you know, the, the investment. And John Deere is the biggest bank, if you think about it, because of all the loans. So it's affordable in a sense that it, the prices come down significantly. And also it is not, for example, in Europe or other countries, they have a different model where the, the, it's subcontracted. So for $10 per acre, you get the yield maps without spending 600,000. So you can still use a lot of different models, but the cost is not the bottleneck in using this. Besides, they get their return on investment by the premiums and the investment, um, as I mentioned, you know, from sustainability. I think you answered my question. I was going to ask how this information gets to the smaller farmer, the non-corporate farmer. And basically, your comment was there aren't going to be many small farmers around anymore. There so. aren't going to be many small farmers growing corn and wheat and soybeans. That's, uh, that's a unfortunate, just straightforward like that. And uh, more land, peri-urban land, will go to more sustainable way of producing vegetables, and which is very much you know, needed. The problem is that the, the environmental impact comes from the large scale. So we got to work on minimizing that environmental impact as we're doing, and we're, we're really becoming successful. The amount of fertilizers goes down, the emissions go. So we're seeing a, a greater adoption, uh, first because technology is very uh, uh, appealing, and, uh, and farmers are understanding that they run large enterprise. So the future is really, a farm could be ran from New York 20 years from now because you've seen the drone that opens by itself, recharges and flies. So didn't want to go too far into this. This was realistic, but that's basically how the large farm is going to happen. That will never change. There is a large farm happening for feeding animals and demand for developing countries. We can't have this colonization approach to saying, you shouldn't be eating meat to people where we ate the, the damage. Now we said, you shouldn't be eating it in China. And so we just have to feel good about making the best of the production in a sustainable way. Then everybody, the market will play itself out on the consumption. 
You gave well, an amazing number there that I don't think sank in with most of us. Food and agricultural systems emit 17 gigatons of CO2 each year. Mm -hmm. And for comparison, a gigaton is really abstract, right? But all of us, all human beings together weigh a little less than half a gigaton. Yes. So this is 35 times or so, 40 times, what all of us weigh gets emitted in, into the air. And the overall is 40 gigatons, including all fossil fuels and everything. So, the so second, this is a really important... It is huge. I mean, agriculture is the second most emitting sector. So, so um, how much do plants actually suck out? You know, we, we eat eventually through the food chain, all the plants. And it, so this is not a net figure that you gave, but no. how much is, is then absorbed by the plants? So that's a, that's a very good question. The problem is it doesn't really almost matter what the plant pulls out if it is going to be reused. That, so that's neutral. We're talking about a mission to pull out that CO2, which is not sustainable. So the amount of fertilizer, we could get the same yield with half of the fertilizer. Not without fertilizer, but with half of that, especially where you tailor. So, for example, the analysis that we did for the U.S., if you do no tillage and uh, cover crops, you could have 0.5 gigatons per year sequestered from roots because then you build soil carbon in the soil. But the problem is, I mean, that's why the government, there are $20 billion invested in conservation measure from this administration just to basically store carbon and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's why I said there is just the sustainability piece, which is intended, again, minimizing emissions. We need to stop emission because, and then everything else will. But if you use the plants that they, they pull, then you're neutral. I mean, then you don't gain that. The storage comes from roots and from residues that they return you know, to the soil or from greater yields because you return greater and you offset the emission someplace else. So a big chunk is still indirect land use, which we can easily prevent. Seeing no more questions, thank you, Bruno. You are so welcome. Thank you.